On today's podcast, I had Travis Chapel on. Travis runs an agency and a software company related to podcasts. He helps people book guests. He helps people get paid to be on other people's shows. And in this episode, we went in depth on the podcast industry as a whole, how much these guys are actually making, especially the A- A-list celebrities. We talk about sponsors and how to go about that. But really what you'll want to stay on the episode for is what I believe is going to be the best strategy going forward, implementing a podcast into basically your business or personal brand. I truly believe that podcast is maybe the most beneficial social media you can do. And I talk about in the episode why I believe that is and all of the benefits that come from having a podcast. So you don't need to have podcasts like mine where everyone comes in studio and you get all this fancy stuff. Um, Travis works with so many other people and 90% of them do Zoom. So there's a lot of ways to go about it. And uh, we're going to break down everything you need to know. So with that being said, let's jump into the episode. Welcome to the Ryan Pineda Show. Where our mission is to invest. I only expect to make money in things that I understand. Innovate. It's about believing in the future and thinking that the future will be better than the past. And inspire. I am much more likely to hit my goal just due to putting it out there. Now rocking with the best. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Ryan Pineda Show. Today, I've got a podcast. I don't even know what I'd call this guy, but he's a podcast guru, booker. He's built a business all around podcasts called Guestio. And um, I've had many people recommend him. And I think it's going to be really good to get his insight on podcasts in general, what the game's like, and you know, some good tips for if you're trying to get your podcast out there or get featured on podcasts. I think uh, we're going to discuss all those things. I've got none other than Travis Chapel. What's up, dude? What's up? What's happening? Thanks for having me. Yeah, dude. So... I kind of gave you a little intro, but tell the people who you are, man. Yeah, I'll do kind of like 30,000 foot zoomed out <clears throat> view of the last decade or so, get everybody caught up. So I grew up super religious in Southern California. And uh, I say super religious because there's some context there. Uh, graduated kindergarten on the same campus that I graduated college from. So from the time that I was three, started going to Sunday school, enrolled in kindergarten, Went kindergarten through 12th grade at the school. And then they also had a college on the same campus, ministerial, purely ministerial college. Mm-hmm. So I went there until I was about 21. Um, and for the some, first time in my life, left the bubble when I was 21. And I was already married. I got married to my high school sweetheart um, at the time. And uh, she and I moved up to this other place, uh, this other beautiful part of California called Fresno. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> The armpit of California? Yeah, exactly. But- okay you know, Lancaster, which is where I was from. So Fresno was actually, in our view, like a step up. Yeah, true. If you know anything about Fresno, you know what that says about Lancaster. So anyway, uh, at that point, I realized like I didn't want to be in ministry, even though I just got a degree in Bible and church ministries, which is completely useless unless you use it for that thing. You know what I mean? Right, and right. then on top of that, it was unaccredited. So it was even more useless than like a regular Bible degree. And, uh, but I, I was married and I had I bought my first house I was when I was 21. And so like I had a mortgage to pay and I had a wife and there was like the, the option of like sleeping on my mom's couch wasn't really there. So I did the only thing I knew how to do at the time, which was door to door. And I did door to door sales for full time for about three or four years. Um, when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, made it a goal to hit six figures. After I hit six figures, I was like 22, made six figures, knocking hundred percent commission alarm sales, um, in Fresno. And at that point I was like, man, I really don't want to be doing this when I'm 32 or when I'm 33. Not really sure what to do. Back against the wall. Finally came up to like this point where I got into personal development a lot because I was just like, I don't know what to do next. Reading some books, listening to audiobooks, came across these things called podcasts and really liked the format, like that it was conversational in style, but it was still like added value. There's a little bit of entertainment, but a little bit of value. So I started listening, consuming a bunch of shows, started my own show. And then after that show started doing well, started connecting with a bunch of people who wanted to know what we were doing and why it was working, how we were interviewing good people. And uh, started doing coaching consulting for entrepreneurs on how to build profitable podcasts. And then through that is what eventually led to Guestio because they all had the same problems. Number one, how do we interview really good guests? Number two, how do we get interviewed on good shows so that we can grow our audience through other people's audiences? And so Guestio is a software that we built to kind of solve that problem, which turned into an agency, which we launched at the beginning of this year. Um, And then we finished up a a seed round for the software uh, portion of the company um, 1.3 million in uh, August of last year. So now since then, we've been 100% focused in on growing the software and then building the agency on the back end. Super cool. So tell me a little bit about the software. Like, how does it work? 
Sure. So it's a, if you're familiar with Cameo, that was kind of where I got the idea from. I essentially was always trying to level up the guests that I was talking to on my show. And there wasn't anywhere that allowed me to go do that. It just it was all back channels. It's always like you get to know somebody who introduces you to somebody who introduces you to somebody. And then you go to this event, you go to this mastermind, you send some cold DMs. Most of them don't get answered. Some of them do. So it was just a long process of finding people. And so I went to Cameo and tried to start booking some people on Cameo. And it worked once or twice, but it also didn't work like seven or eight times. And the thing with Cameo is you pay for the Cameo and then whatever response you get back that's what you paid for. So I was paying people to say no to me. And I was like, I don't know if this is going to be a sustainable, you know, model moving forward. But right. if this existed for the purpose of podcast interviews, I would use it. I would be a customer. And so I went searching for it. Nothing existed. And so we ended up building it. And so essentially it's, there's, there's two different kind of actions you can do. You can pitch people or you can book people. Pitching them means you can have the opportunity to get them on for free, in which case you are a subscriber of the platform on Guestio Pro. So it's 97 bucks a month. You jump in, you build out a media profile, has like your, your bio, your media kit, your pictures, headshots, social links, everything that somebody needs to make an educated decision in order for to decide whether or not they want you on their show. You have this profile living inside the public marketplace in Guestio. People can go to that profile, click it, pitch you for free or book you for a booking fee. Kind of like a speaking fee, but to be on a podcast. So there's a marketplace and then there's the ability to pitch people for free on a subscription. Yeah. No, it's super cool. And then the agency side is just you guys kind of reaching through those back channels to make things happen. The agency side is exactly what the software does, except for it's everything done for you. So right. Like from booking guests on, like we booked, you know, we've booked Shaq on my show. We've booked Rick Ross on a client stage, Raekwon on a client stage. We've worked with Grant Cardone to get on stages, Bob Minery to get them on stages. Like, so we, we work with people on the back end that throw events to get, bring in like big names for their stage. And then also bring in big names for their podcasts. And then work with people on the back end, mostly like our core business on the, on the agency side is representing entrepreneurs who want more traffic or more online credibility and authority. And then getting them booked on shows that bring that to them. Yeah, no, super cool. So what are you seeing as um like booking fees? Like where do these things range? Like where where do guys like, you know, I guess smaller guys and these bigger guys like Cardone and then maybe medium guys like me, like wh what are you seeing in these ranges? Yeah, it's, dude, it's such a massive range uh, because it's subjective. You know, right. It's not really like a standardized pricing model on people's time. It's all whatever they view their time as being worth. And so, you know, people, people like Grant, like he'd, just doesn't do it that often and he has so many ways that he makes money now that he just doesn't care that much to go on a bunch of people's shows all the time so like if you want to lock him down for a virtual event you're gonna be paying tens of thousands of dollars to be able to get him to speak even just on zoom to your yeah you know, event for a half an hour right you know, 50 plus thousand uh to, to bring him in front of your your audience for a virtual event that's probably would be a good deal um and then what we what we usually do is like if we're booking somebody for a virtual event, we usually just try to book them into the podcast as a part of the fee. It's like, look, we'll pay your full speaking fee. We also want to do a podcast episode with you before the event starts. Ah, that's a good way to get kind of double value. Yeah, so we kind of wrap it in and um, and at least at least ask if we can repurpose the virtual um, speech or interview as a podcast episode if they're okay with us licensing the, the content. Yeah, moving forward. Um, and then, you know, you have, you have like the A-list, A-list people, you know, like we, we've worked with people like Oscar De La Hoya and, and some of those guys. And depending on the show, you know, that, that's, that's the, the, the tough thing about this is like, if we work with a really good show and they have a massive audience and this person happens to be like promoting a book launch or something, they may not charge anything. It's like, mm -hmm. Hey, we want to get Oscar De La Hoya. And he's like, okay, well I'm promoting this whatever fight or I have a book coming out. Right. And this show is also a massive show. It's like, okay, well we can, depending on timing, we might be able to get that person booked for free. Um, but if you're just like, Hey, I want to book this person. They have nothing going on and you just want to get some of their time. It's going to be probably minimum 25 K to get, to get Oscar De La Hoya on a podcast or something like that. Mm. Um, but then most of the A-list celebrities want to speak in an event. They're six figures plus. Uh, yeah. And then obviously if it's in person, usually there's private jet time, fuel costs. They have a team of six people that fly with them. <laughs> really expensive, like really quick, you know? Dang dude, these guys are rolling deep. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, you know, on my show thus far, um, I've been fortunate that everybody who's um, come on has come on for free and mm -hmm. we haven't had to like kind of try to utilize these things. Like it's just kind of happened organically, but I know that that's not the case for 99% of people. Mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah, it's funny, man. Cause I just, I, I see these kind of fees in the background. Um, people have paid to come on my show. I don't publicly advertise it or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it's, it's been cool. Yeah. You know, yeah. people that have come on and paid, they've gotten great results, right? right? Because they've, you know, they've come to, you know, bring awareness to their business and, you know, I've, I've heard many people get great results. I think um, that's the biggest misconception Yeah, is that people treat podcasts like it's PR because PR agencies were the quickest ones to adopt getting people booked on podcasts because it was already within the realm of what exactly what they were doing. They were just pitching traditional media companies, mm-hmm. but podcasts and PR are, to me, totally different channels. They are approached the same in the term, like you have to pitch people, find a good angle and like the, it's very similar, but the medium is completely different because podcasts bring traffic. Right. Publications don't necessarily bring traffic unless it's a very good, like actual staff journalist type article. Yeah. Most a PRs, podcast would be yes. way better than a Correct. news article about you. Right. Exactly. So to me, that's why, that's why we encourage people to have a budget for it. Cause it's just like, look, this, I mean, this is really, a, it's a marketing expense. Yeah. It's it not is. just like awareness or whatever. It's like, you can get on a good show and if you have a solid back end make six figures on a single show, oh, just yeah. a single appearance, you know, and even if you don't just the authority and credibility that you get from being on the show that you can take and, and publicize to all of your other, you know, traffic channels or marketing, um, uh, efforts is worth, is worth the experience itself. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I, I mean, even myself included, like I've been on many different shows, um, a lot of big ones. And every time I go on a big show, there's immediate traffic, six yeah. figures of traffic, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. for my businesses. So, yeah, I think podcasts are great. I think people, um, if you got a business, it is definitely worth paying to go on podcast. If you're going on the right podcast, obviously, yeah. you know, you having a plumber company is probably not going to go great for my podcast, Yeah, you know, yeah. but you go on a plumbing, uh, plumber's a bad example, but for most um, yeah, yeah. digital entrepreneurs, I should say, there's a lot of value. So what do you see on like the podcaster side? So, you know, let's say these guys who... um are listening or thinking about starting a show? Like how could you monetize your show? Yeah. I tell people if you're in business, you should have a podcast regardless of if you ever intend on having an audience or monetizing that audience in any way, because it'll open doors for you that nothing else can open. Like when when I, when I was first getting started, I realized this really, really early on. I was lucky enough to realize it really early on. I reached out to a couple of guys when I first started my show that I really wanted to bring on my show. And at the, and at the time they were really big names for me and I had been following them for a little while and they made complete sense for me to bring them on. And so I reached out cold email, cold pitch. And, uh, I asked them both the same, the same ask, like, can I get three minutes of your time? I have just one quick question I wanted to ask you. I figured it was a really small ask. It'd be easy to get in touch with them. Both of them responded and said no. One of them was like, look, I got like I've run this mastermind group. People pay 30 grand to be in this group and they get like one-on-ones with me as as a part of it. It wouldn't be fair to me to give that to you for free. I was like, all right, fair enough. Other guy was like, Yeah, I just I don't I don't do one-on-one calls, but if you can just, you know, shoot the question back in an email, I'll respond to the email. So I respond back to both of them and I mentioned something about my podcast. And then both of them, unprompted, were like, I'll come on the show though if you want to do an interview. And I was like, Oh, I, I thought I thought I was asking the smaller thing by asking a three minute like phone call question. Like nobody even knows we even had to have this conversation. It's three minutes. We could do it right now, really quickly. But you're gonna say no to that. You're gonna say yes to a 45 minute podcast interview that we have to schedule, <laughs> sit in front of Zoom for, and I can advertise to both my and your audience that you were on my show. This is this is it was like a mind blowing moment for me because I was like, this is this is a secret weapon. It's a tool that I can use to like put me in front of people that would never give me the time of day otherwise. And so now you fast forward, it's like almost every single person that I've wanted to get on my show as at this point I've gotten on my show, even a couple people from like my never thought I'd be able to get them on my show list, right? Like Rob Deerdeck and Shaquille O'Neal, you know what I mean? Like people like these are like childhood heroes of mine. I'm having conversations with on a freaking podcast. Like if it was just like, Hey, let's jump on a call, a phone call or whatever. Like most of the, like the biggest reason why people can't connect with the people they want to connect with is they don't have a reason to connect. Right. It's just like, Oh, let me pick your brain. It's like, that's not a fun activity. (laughs) Like like neither one of us want to get our brains picked. You know what I'm saying? Like, but if you want to do a podcast interview, like I don't even, I don't need to know that much about you. I just need to know that you're not going to waste my time. We're going to have a good conversation. You're going to publish it. And there's, even if you have 400 people that listen to your show, that's 400 people that didn't know about me before. 
You know, if, if you're going to put me in front of a live event and you're, there's 400 people in the audience, like I'm going to say yes to that. Why wouldn't I say yes to this podcast? They're like, sure, I'll go on your show. Not yeah. a big deal. No, 100%. So it, 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 to me, it's like, if you're thinking about it, even if you, like I said, even if you never even intend on getting a big audience or monetizing, or getting sponsors or becoming a podcaster, it's still like the best connection tool that you can have in your arsenal, in my opinion. If you're listening to this podcast, then my guess is you're interested in real estate investing. Some of you are just starting out while others are trying to scale their business to the next level. But the problem is with so much information out there, most people don't know which program or coach to trust. Well, I'm a bit biased, but I believe my company, Future Flipper, can help you get to the next level. We've coached thousands of students from all over the world on how to build their real estate investing business. It doesn't matter whether you want to flip, wholesale, or buy rentals. Our coaching program has everything you need to become a great investor. There are many things that we include with coaching, but to give you a few examples, you're going to get an accountability coach. These are people that have had success in their own business, and they want to make sure that you achieve success in yours. We also have all of our documents, our systems, and processes that I've used to buy hundreds of homes. You can copy and paste them directly into your own business. And we have events where you get to meet me, top-level guest speakers, and other students who are crushing it. My students do deals with each other, and I personally do deals with them too. In fact, at a recent event, I just honored over 20 people in our program that made over a million dollars in the last year. So if you want to grow your real estate business, head over to futureflipper.com and apply for a call with our team. The call is completely free and they can help point you in the right direction whether you work with us or not. So go to futureflipper.com and book your call today. For the last year, the real estate market has been on absolute fire. Prices are at all-time highs, interest rates are at all-time lows, and there is more money in the economy than ever. But with so much competition, many investors are sitting on cash, struggling to find great deals. If this sounds like you, then you need to invest with Pineda Capital. With my network and social media following, we get access to the best real estate deals all over the country. And if you're an accredited investor, you can invest with me on those deals. In fact, last year, we purchased a 334-unit apartment complex in Georgia for almost $20 million. We expect it to be worth well over $30 million when it's all said and done. Our goal with each deal is to build in so much equity from the beginning that we're able to refinance our investors' cash out and own the properties together with little to no money into the deal. And the best part is, you don't have to do anything. Our team will find the deals, handle the renovations, get them leased, and eventually refinance or sold. All you have to do is provide the capital. So if you want exclusive access to our deals before they hit the public, go to PinedaCapital.com to schedule a call. We can put your money to work today to start getting you great returns. So go to PinedaCapital.com now to get access to our deals. Yeah, no, I agree. So I'll, I'll share my experience starting a podcast and hopefully this brings some encouragement to any of you listening, thinking about it. So you know, I started my podcast in early 2021. So I've been going on it for about a year and a half and we're actually about to rebrand the podcast. This might be like legit my last episode as the Ryan Pineda show. Wow. Um, we, we built a new studio downstairs. The, there's going to be a new name and uh, I'm excited about it. So, but you know, it's, it's the podcast has been amazing, not only because, um, you know, it's doing well, but we've created so much content from our reels and TikToks from it. Yes. So it's just been such an, a, a great tool for content. But probably the biggest benefit that I personally have seen is that I get to interview so many cool people. And because it's in person, um, they come here, we build a relationship, and then it leads to, you know, all these other things down the road, you know? Totally. So, um, being able to have all these high level guys. And like you said, it's, it's good for them. They get exposed to my audience. They know I've got a lot of eyeballs. And so it's, it's a win-win for them and you know, they're happy to come on, mm -hmm. you know? So I think podcasts are great and it's not going to start out that way. You know, for me, I had exactly. to, to grow it and it's continuing to grow. You know, I was talking to Lewis house who's been doing it a long time. Lewis House might have been the first podcast to ever listen to. Okay. And he's going to come on the show um, at some point too. Him and I are friends now. But, um, you know, he was saying like, dude, your your growth in your first year has been amazing. He's like, man, I, I look back at the School of Greatness our first year and it was rough. Yeah. And it's like, man, he's been doing it for how many years now? I don't even know. Decade, probably. Uh, yeah, a decade. 
and you see where he's at today. And it's like, all he does is focus on his podcast and he gets amazing guests. People would kill to be on his show Mm -hmm. and he makes great money from all the things his podcast brings. And he loves interviewing people. He just legit loves it. Yeah. So I think for me, man, it's been getting to build the relationships. That's been really fun. The the type of rapport that you can build in a podcast interview is unmatched compared to any other sort of like content creation or platform. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, even if you have someone speak at your event, they're speaking to your audience, but like, you're not, they're not speaking to you. You're not having a conversation with them. Like a podcast is literally just a conversation about whatever you, the host decide the conversation should be about. So the cool thing is like, if you're curious about something, you can go bring on, if you have like someone like Lewis, you can go bring on the foremost expert in that thing and just ask them whatever questions you want to ask them. You know, we've had probably four or five billionaires on the show. I would have never been able to talk to a billionaire if I didn't have a show. Like I would have gotten stopped at like the gatekeepers, gatekeepers, gatekeeper. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't have even made it to like the billionaire's gatekeeper. I would have gotten stopped like three gatekeeper levels down before I made it up to him for what, a five minute phone call to ask about my like little podunk business when he's running a multi-billion dollar corporation. But like um, uh, a couple of them, their teams have reached out to me because he's in promoting a book or something and wanted to get on some shows and their team reached out to me to set up an interview with a billionaire. It's like, how did this happen? Mm -hmm. It's not because I'm awesome. It's just because people need publicity and there's value to be added there. And if I can be the person that helps sell some more books, then they're willing to spend 20, 30 minutes of their day with me. And I can ask them whatever questions I want to ask them. And it's acts as like a knowledge and, and skill set accelerator as well as a network accelerator. Yeah. No, I agree. I love it. It's easy for me because I don't need to prep for content. I just talk to people, bring cool people on. I'll just have a normal conversation with them and it works out great. Yep. Um, so on the guestio side, what about sponsors? Yep. Have you got have you guys thought about integrating people to sponsor shows on there? Yeah, so that's kind of on the con on the uh product roadmap. Um we we technically have it available right now. It's just not super robust in the way that we would report. Um, the only problem with adding uh, sponsorships into the software is that you have to have the ability to confirm that the ad read went out, uh, which is more difficult on podcasts than it is on other forms of of media because you have to actually like get timestamps of the published episode and confirm that the sponsorship was done. And then, you know, if the ad underperforms, then it's like, okay, well, do we refund a certain amount of money to the person paying for the ad? Do we just disclose that it might underperform? Do we just charge less? Like there's a lot of more te- like technically challenging things that come along with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is absolutely on the product roadmap because our goal is essentially just to build out the biggest marketplace of shows and content platforms available. Right. Starting in podcasts, but then also moving into YouTube, blogs. We have a couple of newsletters on there. You can buy like advertisements on newsletters, like anywhere where there's a content channel that has an audience and they are not monetizing it correctly. There's somebody that wants to buy space in front of that audience. So if we can build the biggest marketplace because we have the beachfront established on the guesting side, then it'll be a lot easier for us to later on to add in, you know, sponsorships or advertising or some of these other monetization opportunities for the shows that we work with. Right. Because we already paid out this year, I mean, this is technically really our first year in business. Like we launched last year, but you know, software products are um, a different beast and there's a lot of iterations and feedback and testing that goes into it. So I, like this year is like really more of like our formal launch year. And we've already paid out over $300,000 to creators on our platform, both mm. on the guests and show side uh, combined. And so that's within the first six, seven months of of really like pushing it. So I think that the the opportunity, that's just on the guesting side. So the more that we can continue to pay out people on guesting, the easier to be for us to integrate some sort of a sponsorship or advertising deal um, in the future. Yeah. So when you guys um, look at downloads and stuff, are you strictly just looking at like Apple Podcast or Spotify or are you adding YouTube into it? How does that play? Yeah. On the download side, it's whatever the media host says. The media host is the is the only real way to know what somebody's getting in terms of reach or traction on the actual podcast itself. Cause it's all tracked through their RSS feed, which is kept inside of the media host. So, you know, somebody might have the majority of their audience on Spotify. So if you look at Apple podcasts, you're not going to get a clear understanding of how big their audience is. If they are mostly an Apple podcast, you look at Spotify, you're not gonna get an understanding of how big their audience is. And so 
Um, there's third party data sources that estimate downloads that we certainly use uh, uh, as much as we can. But at the end of the day, the only real way to know how, how much traction a show is getting is to look at their actual media host. Because we can connect YouTube. That's simple enough. We can just integrate YouTube into the platform right. and grab the stats from YouTube because it's all open. Podcasts aren't that way. So we have to get we have to get the show host to essentially to essentially like send us screenshots of their media host so that we can verify that the numbers that they're advertising are actually accurate. Right, right. Yeah, I was just looking through my numbers. Um, it just seems like the numbers keep gradually going up. It, it seems like it's a slow kind totally. of accumulation. Totally. I remember when I first started, it was like, you know, a thousand downloads and that was great. And thousands a lot when you start. And then mm -hmm. it was two, then it's three, then it's four. And yeah, it looks like we're around on, not average. I mean, some are like 10, 20,000, they go crazy. And then others are, you know, like I would say the average is looking at the stats is like 4,000 just on Buzzsprout, which yep. we look at. Yep. And then I look on YouTube and it, you know, most of them are like 2,000 views on YouTube, 3,000. I mean. So that puts you like top 5% of all podcasts. Okay. Yeah. And then we got some really big ones like Hermosis did great at 50,000 plus views. Cody Sanchez got 11,000. Nice. Yeah. So if I, that's top 5%. We got to get in the top one. That's the goal. Yeah. I mean, you, you get to 10,000 downloads an episode on the podcast, you're doing better than 99% of other shows. Yeah. And, but that's on the podcast side. You, if you add in the YouTube impressions, you're probably already top 1%. You know what I mean? But on like just podcast stats in general, mm -hmm. um, top 50% is anything above 200 downloads an episode. The yeah. majority of podcasts will never make it past 200 downloads an episode. Wow. So if you're over 1,000, you're already like top 20%. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. We, um, you're probably closer to top two, top 2%, top 3% at 4,000 episode. Yeah. I think the goal is to get to a legit, top i don't know i don't i don't even have a goal it's just gonna grow over time yeah. like i'm not even like well, i mean that's the nice it. thing about <laughs> you're not a podcaster yeah you're an entrepreneur and the podcast is something that you do yeah. so it's like it's you do it for me. deal flow and connections and networking and it's a good break in the day if you're like banging away on your keyboard all day and then you just like yeah. oh cool i get to have a fun conversation with somebody like yesterday dude i was talking to this guy he he set the world he has 10 world records right now and the most, like, the one that he's no, most well known for that he's been on, like, the Today Show, the Tonight Show, Joe Rogan, and all this other stuff talking about was he did the first ever um, unsupported solo trek across Antarctica mm. by, like, by himself hiking across Antarctica, carrying a 375 pound sled behind him with absolute, like, that had all of his supplies for the entire run, for the entire, like, trek. Like somebody just died last, the year before he did it, tr attempting the same thing. Somebody else got flown out because they didn't have the right amount of supplies. He ran out, of, ran out of his supplies literally on the last day of the trip. And that's like one of the world records that he holds. He also did like the nine peaks, like it's seven peaks plus North Pole, South Pole. Did that in the fastest time that anybody's ever done it in. Just crazy, crazy like world record holder and just fascinating person to talk to you know right. like that was just the middle of my day just recording a podcast episode talking to this fascinating individual getting to ask a bunch of cool questions about it it's like yes yeah. doesn't yeah. count as work to me you know? no 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 this is easy i love it yeah. so yeah podcast easily my favorite thing to do content wise i don't enjoy filming reels i do them because they get so many views and yep. like people love Gotta them to do it yeah but um you know youtube videos i actually stopped making formal you know talking head YouTube videos. Now it's just vlogs, which have been amazing because mm. vlogs are like podcasts. I'm just talking yeah. and whatever happens, happens. Um, More of like documenting yep. kind of. Yeah. yeah. And it, they've been doing better. Really? So it's great. I, I literally now don't really film content anymore. I don't have to plan an idea <laughs> or anything. It's just like, yeah. I talk to people all day and it's great. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so I think with sponsors, it's funny because on my podcast, um, I originally had sponsors and like people want to sponsor it, but yeah. you know, the more I looked at it, the more I'm like, dude, I make way more money just throwing out my own companies. Yep. It doesn't make any sense. Cause like the sponsors get really picky, you know, yeah. like I, I did it for a little while and then I think we still have some running, but my, my producer does all of that. So I just like set it and forget it. He does the recordings and makes sure that they're all good or whatever. But when sponsors started getting picky and it was like, look, you're paying me like $340 and you're asking me to spend like an hour doing this ad. It's just like, this is a disproportionate amount of my time to yeah. spend for, to make what an extra $2,200 a month. Like, yeah. no, I'll just send people into my own stuff. Like this isn't worth it. 
But you know, the big shows, obviously it's worth it for them. Oh yeah. Well, my buddy, my buddy, um, John makes six figures a month, passive sponsorship revenue. Yeah. Just every month, six figures. What's his show? Entrepreneur on Fire. Okay. Yeah. John Lee Dumas. He's, he been, I mean, he, he coached Lewis House when he started his show. He coached mm. Tim Ferriss when he started his show. He took, he coached Tom Oh, Ty hook Lopez me up with John, when dude. When he started his show. Yeah. I'll definitely make a connection. Yeah. I need to, I need some help. I have no formal training at all. You're, I just wing it. You're already killing it, dude. Yeah, you're already <laughs> yeah but I want to know what John has to say. He, he's going to help me get to that upper echelon. Yeah, dude. He, uh, yeah, it makes me sick when we talk about. Uh, and you can look all like if you're listening right now, you can go to eofire.com. I'm gonna look it up, and you can look at his exact revenue. He does uh, fin- he does finance reports at the end of every month, so you can look at all of his revenue from he from when he started in 2012 until today. You could look at every single month exactly what he made gross, exactly what he made net, and exactly what he spent his money on, what his, what his expenses were on. So is he not big on YouTube? No, not at all. Yeah, he's only got 14,000 on subs. Yeah, he so doesn't his, do anything on YouTube. His podcast is just all podcast. All audio, yep. He doesn't even record, like, if you look at his Instagram, he doesn't even, like, record the video. It's literally just audiograms. <laughs> we, okay. He does not if, care. if him and I talk together, <laughs> right, I gotta have a word with him. Yeah. <laughs> because you think, why? Why are you, why are you, Putting all the work in not to get like you would the think, full reward. You would think you would care, bro. I trust me. I've, I've been like, dude, why, why don't you just? He's like, he's like, he, he set his life up. He's just one of those dudes, man. He's just like, if you look at his income reports, he'll make like 180 grand in a month, but he keeps 160 of it. He yeah. has he has 15 percent expenses. He runs literally 80 to 90 percent profit margins in his business. So lives, many- in, lives in Puerto Rico. Oh, he works guy. six days a month. Six days a month he works. And just like, does it's all thing. virtual podcast too. Yep. Yep. He just yeah. uh, like, he's just like, I set my life up the way I like to live. And, uh, that's what I do. It's I'm looking like, at it now. He's, uh, but he'll still crush. Like he'll do like the, he'll do affiliate contests and like his organic audience is so massive. Like he still crushes. He was top five in the Dean and Tony launch, you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah. I'm um, looking at it Fiji now. And stuff. How but, many uploads do you think he gets? Uh, he or gets, downloads, he I gets guess. over, he gets over 2 million a month. Two million. Well, but he's got such a, a huge catalog. Like, what? Yeah. Do, what do his like episodes get you? Think? I don't know the exact number. If I were to guess, I would say north of fifty thousand an episode. Yeah, that would that'd be that would be my guess. That's legit. And how long's he been doing it? Twenty twelve. Oh man, ten years. Yeah. Most people want to get rich at all costs. They make sacrifices with their family, their health, and their faith, all in the pursuit of money, without even realizing it. But what if I told you it doesn't have to be that way? What if you could grow your wealth in all areas of life? Well, it's possible, and that's why I created The Wealthy Way. It's a community of people striving to grow together in all areas. And we have multiple tools for you to use that are completely free. You can get access to The Wealthy Way Planner, where you can set goals and hold yourself accountable on a daily basis. We also have our Wealth Builder Academy, which is over four hours of content teaching you how to manage your time, create the right goals, and all the biggest secrets I've used to grow my life, not only in my net worth, but in all aspects. Lastly, we have our Discord community where thousands of wealth builders are all over the world encouraging one another and growing together. And once again, all of this is completely free. There are no upsells, there are no hidden catches. For me, this is a passion project and I want to build a community of like-minded people. So if you want to start living the wealthy way today, go to wealthyway.com. There you can get all the free resources like the course, planner, and Discord community. So go to wealthyway.com. All right. He took off. Love- yeah. So you have those people that where it's worth sponsor, like, like Lewis Howes worth taking sponsors, like John worth taking sponsors. Jordan Harbinger gets 11 million downloads a month, but, but you he know, he makes money purely from sponsors. He doesn't even have any programs. Even at that point though, I still wonder even if it would be beneficial for me because putting those eyeballs on my own products would make more. Yeah, no, that's true. That's fair. That's fair. And yes, I mean, I mean, Lewis obviously has, Lewis is probably the most like integrated of those ones. Like, so you have like Jordan Harbinger, who's like, pure, he's purely a podcaster. Right. He has literally nothing to sell except for his podcast episodes that he gives away for free. So he's he makes money purely on sponsorships, but he gets 11 million downloads a month. And you have John, he's kind of like mix of marketer and podcaster. And you have Lewis, who's like fully integrated, like marketer, podcaster, does a bunch of other things as well as has an organic audience, you know. So there's there's multiple ways, multiple ways to do it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So yeah, man, podcast is great. I think um, my goal, honestly, 
is I would like to be known more so for my podcast than all my other content. You know, I mean, people now see me like, oh, you're the guy on TikTok or, you know, I love watching your YouTube channel or reels, but you know, and there are a lot of people who say like, we like your podcast, but I would say the podcast is, um, maybe the lowest viewed of them. Cause I mean, podcast is always going to be lower than I can go get 50. I I literally can go get millions of views on a reel like tomorrow on accident. Yeah. (laughs) On accident. (laughs) So like, it's never going to be the same, but the quality of person who listens exactly. to a podcast is so different. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. The The worst thing about podcasts is discoverability. Absolutely the worst thing. Like you can post a thousand podcast episodes and they're probably all going to be very similar in terms of downloads per episode. Like you're not going to, you're not going to have disproportionate viewership changes in a podcast. Like you are going to have, like you can post 10 reels and one of them can get 1.3 million and one of them can get like 750 views total. You know what I'm saying? Like there, there's wide discrepancy in the in the amount of total reach because the discoverability on those platforms is way better. So even if you're like a you know beginner content creator, you could have something pop off on TikTok. You could have something pop off on YouTube or YouTube Shorts, especially YouTube Shorts. You could have something pop off on IG Reels. If you're creating a podcast, the odds of like a single episode just like popping off are extremely extremely yeah. low. It's just not going to happen. Like unless like a some sort of news outlet picks up a story and links directly to that podcast episode, like it's just not going to work out that way. You might have some that are that are higher and some that are lower, but it's not going to be disproportionate. Like our our episodes that do really well are like thirty percent higher than our episodes that don't do as well. Yeah, you're not They're getting not, a million versus yeah. a few thousand. It's not four thousand percent higher on one episode. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Discoverability is garbage, but the ability to build a relationship with the end user in a podcast is, in my opinion not even close to yeah. any of the other platforms that are there. And it's literally, if you think about it, it's literally the last frontier when it comes to long form content consumption. Cause every platform now, including YouTube and Facebook are chasing TikTok. Yeah. Cause TikTok took over last November as the most viewed as the most, highest watch time, most watch time, which blew my mind when it happened. Cause YouTube has videos that are like freaking 12 hours of but just people, white noise and people shit. People would rather just watch <laughs> TikTok. They get the little dopamine hits every time they scroll, you know what I mean? So, uh, YouTube started playing catch up. They came up with YouTube shorts. They they rank you, reward you for using shorts. Facebook and Instagram want you on reels instead of Facebook watch. And instead of IGTV has gone. Yeah. You know, their IGTV was supposed to be a play against YouTube. TikTok came out and they were like, screw that. We're here with reels now. And they completely took, went away with IGTV. Yeah. It's like, wow, everybody's, everybody's optimizing for short form content right now. The only one that isn't is podcasts. Yeah. So the ability to spend time with a consumer or a listener or end user on a podcast is unprecedented compared to any other platform. They could watch a hundred reels and not spend as much time with you as they're going to spend by listening to this one podcast episode. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I think for those listening, okay, here's what I would do. If you are trying to build your brand, okay. And, and get more traffic for your business. Like I'm, I'm firsthand um, proof of this. Like social media is the way to go. It ain't going anywhere. If you're not doing it, somebody else in your industry is, and they're taking your customers. Yep. Okay. So number one, that's first off. Even if they're worse than you. Even if they're worse than you, yeah. they're taking your customers, right? Okay, so knowing that, if you're deciding to start today, my approach is what I would do, is a blend of something long form like a podcast, but repurpose it into a short form. Don't do what, you know, John Lee's doing. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay? Yeah, that, that only worked because of the timing that he did it and the way that his brand blew Yeah, up. he did it 10 it's years ago. It's not going to work now. It and will he not would, work. And he'll be the first to tell you that, by yeah. the way. We've, we've had this conversation. Yeah. So film it the way I do. Get multiple camera angles, you and the guest. Get just any guest, right? Like, you don't need to go get big names yet and all that stuff. Like, just get started, okay? You don't, like, and then use Guestio as a resource too to try and get some other people. But, you know, you get started, you film it, you then break it off into reels and TikToks and YouTube shorts, post it all across those things. That'll help you get noticed. And then from there, what I would do anyways, and I've done this, is put a little icon on those reels that just says, you know, the Ryan Pineda show, like whatever, whatever your podcast is called. So that way they can see like, oh, this was a clip from the Ryan Pineda show. I might as well go look up and see what's what's going on there. And then they can watch the full episode. Um, I've actually just started doing that with my YouTube channel. Um, I've started taking like little eight to 12 minute clips from the podcast, yeah. throwing them on my main YouTube channel. And it's basically like, hey, if you want to see the full episode, go to the podcast. And that's been getting us a lot more traffic. Rather than just putting the entire podcast episode 
as a as an upload. Yeah, saying? so like we have two separate YouTube channels. One's the podcast, one's my main. Got it. Got and it. so I'll put the clip on my main because they're used to 10 minute videos. Right. right. And you YouTube know. optimizes for that. Exactly. And so then they can go subscribe to the podcast on the YouTube. So that's what I would advise everyone doing. Like I think podcasts are great. Um and there's a lot of ways you can do it. You don't have to go get guests like I do. You don't have to do it in person like I do. You can do Zoom. Mm-hmm. Tons, how many people do Zoom versus in person, would you say? 90% probably. 90% do Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm a rare breed in that it's in person because I, I know that the chopped up content is going to be better. Well, and it's the, for you, it's the extra credibility too of like people walking into your office, seeing like the entire setup and the organization that you have, like all of that is very much like setting up it's a an frame experience for you to do business with them. Like Brad does, um, Brad Lee does the same thing. You know, like the amount of people that he does business with that come in for his podcast, but like they come in for the podcast, but then they see the office and they see the operation, they see everything that he's doing. And then he ends up doing business with them. Like he uses it purely for that. I, I, for actually that pen holder that you have on your desk is from uh, the Money Is Show. I know that that's all that they do. Yep. For, for, for their show is like, they barely even post the episodes. It's literally just like they have multi-million dollars state of the art office space and studio space. They bring people in, make them feel like a rock star and then, yep. um, and then get them out. But then there's plenty of room and opportunity to business afterwards, which is like, if you're doing in person and you have a bunch of stuff like that, it's probably a good idea to do it all in person. Yeah. And they say that from the beginning, you know, Andrew and those guys are great. Um, yeah. he's been on the show and I've been on his show and, yeah, like you said, they they don't even care about the podcast itself. They just want you to see what they got going on and yep. see how they can integrate. So, yeah, either way, okay, if you're going to do a podcast and you're going to go get customers to your business or you're going to get guests who are going to eventually be assets to your business and you can be assets to theirs, it works great, you know? I think um, that's the way to go in today's future. Um, don't worry about sponsors and monetization. Just put out good content and... Um, like I said too, structure wise, it can be different. If you want to go zoom, go zoom. You know, if you, if you don't have an office like I have, that's fine. Do zoom. You, you know, you're not going to invite people to your house. Well, maybe, yeah. I mean, even my buddy Graham Stefan, right? He, yeah. His podcast is exploding and it's at his house. I see really, you know, people <laughs> go to his house and cause you yeah. don't have an office, Yeah. you know? So, um, you could still do it at your house if that's what you're, if people are willing to see you, people are obviously willing to see me. And there's things that you can do too, that help maybe increase the quality a little bit. So like sometimes what we'll do, um, uh, especially if it's like a, a bigger, more, you know, anchor type name, um, is like recently we, when, when we had Ed Milet on the show again, it was a zoom interview, but my uh, videographer had a camera set up on the other side of my computer filming me like in my studio setup so that when I'm, so when we do the split screen on like repurposed content, there's still like the HD camera, like high quality video when I'm asking questions and then the, his responses are just on Zoom. Right. You don't have to do like the boring like Zoom split screen that right. just looks really bad and has a lower tendency of being shared on social. Um, you can do stuff like that, just like setting up a, a camera that's recording you being recorded, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And then yeah. just when you're talking, you have that view instead of like the Zoom camera. There's a couple of things like that that you can do that just... Zoom makes it just as effective. Like the bottom line is the big reason to get those big guests is just so people on social see you spending time with those people. Yeah. Because it brings massive amounts of credibility and authority to a brand. I literally was on a show right before I came over here and the girl was like, yeah, I don't even remember how we, how we found you. But my, my, you know, my booker came over to me and was like, look at all the people like that he's on a show. Like, I don't know who he is, but like, look at all the people he's had in a show, you know? Was yeah. Like, he must be exactly the reason. Exactly. Like they don't know who Travis is, but they know Shaq. You know, they don't like Rob Deerdeck or, um, you know, Nicola Para or Jasmine Starr or any of the other people that I've had on my show. They can look at the list and be like, oh, well, not like all those people can't be wrong. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like maybe one person, maybe one or two people can go screw up and, and realize this guy's not worth spending time with. But <laughs> you have like three dozen people. It's like, well, you know, they, they, they probably did some research and I'll probably find going on this guy's show or bringing this guy on my show or doing business with them in some context. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that was the reason. So, you know, most people come to my office, but I, f- I filmed a bunch of virtual shows too. But like when I was in New York, went to Ryan Serhant's office, got to yeah. film with him. Yeah. Um, uh, two weeks ago, I went to Patrick Bed David's office, got yep. to film with him. Dallas, yeah. Well, he's in uh, Florida now. He just moved. Oh, his whole office he moved. Everything. Wow. Yeah, he moved everything. So, um, yeah, you know, it, it definitely helps for sure to be seen with these people and um, – to build a relationship with them too. You totally. build a relationship 
you know, over in person far more than Zoom. So it's cool. Totally. But anyways, dude, I think everyone should start a podcast. I think if you're trying to get started, you know, Guestio is a great resource and Travis Agency. Um, but yeah, man, appreciate yeah. you coming on. Yeah, of course, dude. Yeah, I would just say like start. If you want to get a head start on most podcasters, use Guestio for your, you don't have to use it for every single, like you don't have to pay for every guest you bring on your show. But use it for those like first three to five. If you can earmark a couple grand, you know, one to $5,000 to spend on good guests and you can launch with three to five high quality, big name, I call anchor guests. Yeah. Then you can leverage those names to start pitching all the other people that are going to recognize who those people are. And that'll, that'll give you a year, two year head start on where most people are going to be starting when, when they have their show. So yeah. Do something like that. Just get those first three to five like root, like big names for your industry, whatever that means for you, and then start leveraging those to go in your organic reach out methods um, to to boost your credibility and, and get more bookings done. That'll put you a year ahead just by doing that. 100%. Well, dude, guys, go check it out. If you enjoy the podcast, this might be the very last one I do on this format. So uh, make sure you subscribe. And we got some big things in store because I want to have a top 1% podcast. I'm not satisfied with top 2%. Top half a percent, bro. We need top half a percent. If I'm not getting 50K downloads an episode, I'm not going to be satisfied. So that's the goal. We're going to make it happen. And it's going to take your support, guys. So appreciate you. Any comments below on who you want to see as a guest, let me know. And we're going to get them on. All right. So we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Thanks for watching the Ryan Pineda Show. If you want to work with me, head over to ryanpineda.com. You can find my courses, coaching programs, and upcoming events. We also have free resources you can download, so head over to ryanpineda.com.